Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nick Windsor, Chair of the MS Society, and I'd like to welcome you to our 2018 Annual General Meeting. Joining me at the front are Chief Executive Michelle Mitchell. Good morning. At her last AGM. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, Stuart Secker, our Treasurer and uh, Amber Esposito, who is taking the minutes. Thank you. Uh, many of our trustees and chairs of the National Councils are here today amongst us, uh, and, uh, and also uh, quite a number of the executive group are here almost uh, uh, as well. And, uh, and looking around the room, it looks like those two categories probably outnumber <laughs> those that aren't in those categories by quite a margin. <laughs> So at least, uh, at least those not in the categories can expect plenty of attention. Um, uh, we've all got name badges on uh, to help you recognise um, who we are and, uh, and our roles. Um, if you'd like to follow the agenda, you'll find it on page 28 of the AGM booklet, which you should have. We're webcasting the AGM live, and it will also be available to people to watch afterwards. Um, so, uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to anybody that's, uh, that's uh, joining us, watching online, either live today or catching up at another time. For those of you in the room, this does obviously mean that if you make a contribution to the meeting, then that will be included in the webcast. Before moving to today's business, there are a few housekeeping matters uh, to deal with. If you have hearing difficulties, there is an induction loop. Uh, probably better to sit close to the front because uh, it works better there apparently. Uh, we aren't planning any practice, there aren't any planned practice fire alarms today. So if the alarm does sound, uh, it's a real one and we'll need to evacuate the building by the nearest fire exit. Um, there are MS Society staff uh, on hand who will direct you to a place of safety and once outside the building, the assembly point is along Edgware Road to, uh, to our left. In terms of refreshments, there are water facilities in the room and drinks are also available next door where you had drinks before the meeting started. Um, after the meeting, uh, we'd love uh, you to join us for lunch, which will be in the same place. There are toilets along the corridor at the rear of the room or through the door at the back of main reception. Accessible toilets are well signed. If you need a rest area, you can use the settees in reception or the seating in the cafe where you had refreshments earlier. There's also a small bed on the third floor with soft seating, uh, sorry, a small room with soft seating and a bed. Uh, if you need further respite, please just speak to one of uh, the members of staff who are here today. There's a care assistant on duty uh, this morning throughout the event if anybody should need their assistance. Could you show yourself just at the back? Thank you very much and welcome to you. Um, if you have any other questions or queries, please uh, do go to the registration desk where someone uh, will be available throughout the meeting to assist you. Starting the formal business, we've had apologies for absence from those listed on the slide. Um, so unless there's any additional apologies that anybody wants to report, we'll crack on. Um, no, I see none. The procedural arrangements for this is AGM are on pages 28, 29 of the AGM booklet, and I won't run through those one by one. As with previous years, the electoral reform services are acting as our independent scrutineers to ensure voting has been conducted uh, fairly and accurately. This included uh, postal voting and online voting, which closed on Thursday. If you haven't voted in advance and are voting today, then you should have received <coughs> coloured ballot papers as you arrived. There's a different colour for each item uh, to make it easier as we go through the meeting. So, so if you didn't vote online, or if you didn't look vote previously, you should have those coloured papers. If you haven't, we can supply those. Our teller today is Sorrel, uh, who will be collecting the ballot papers. 
Uh, can you make yourself known, Sorrel? Just there, back on the right. Thank you. Um, the first ballot um, that will close is the elections for trustees and national councils, and we'll be collecting these votes in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. You'll need the green paper for the trustee elections and the yellow paper for the national council elections. Trustee candidates' personal statements were on page 12 and 13 of the AGM booklet. The candidates are Susan Crane, Sarah Cormack, and Sh Schwinkgren, and Rufus Olins. Those who are elected will start their terms on the 1st of January next year. For one of these candidates, that's Anne, it would be the second term. Candidates' profiles for those standing in the national councils as nat national council members were also in the AGM booklet from pages 15 to 27. As you probably know, in these elections, you can only vote for candidates in your nation or in England, in your region. That does mean that some of you who live in England won't have had a vote for a council member this year, either because there wasn't an election in your region this year or because there wasn't a candidate in your region. There'll be a test on all, all this later. Um, also, since the election started, we've had three candidates uh, withdraw in Wales, and that's marked on the ballot paper. At this year's meeting, we have two specific resolutions on Stop MS Appeal and on growing the MS Society's community, as well as two more standard financial-related resolutions uh, receiving the annual reports and accounts and uh, appointments of auditors. All the resolutions are recommended by the board. Uh, Ruth Hasnip and Kerry Smith will speak on the first and second of these. Stuart Secker, our treasurer, will speak on the third and fourth. In each case, after they've spoken, the floor will be open to members of the charity who are here today to discuss these resolutions. We'll collect ballot papers for each resolution immediately after it's been discussed. Um, when we open up the floor, um, please, um, after those introductions to the resolutions, what we'd like to do is um, focus the discussion on the specific resolutions um, or the specific resolution at hand at the time. There'll be a, an opportunity later on uh, for a more open discussion of uh, including any other queries or, um, or uh, comments that you'd like to raise. Uh, we'll bring a mic to you if you wish to contribute. That's obviously so that the webcast can pick it up. Uh, so if you want to contribute, please feel free to raise your hand or ask your neighbour to raise theirs. If you can't, we'll bring the mic to you. If you are speaking, then, then do please tell us your name before making the contribution. I'll try my best to uh, allow everybody to get a say. Or everybody that wants to, I guess. Um, that brings us to the minutes and matters arising from last year's AGM. The minutes from last year are on pages 32 to 35 in the AGM booklet. Uh, I'm not aware of any amendments having been put forward, so I'd intend to sign these off as an accurate record. If any, but if anyone, if anybody has any comments, um, then please, would you say now? <coughs> Good, I'll take silence as, um, as a good job done, um, and therefore I shall sign off the minutes. I'm now going to close voting on election of trustees and National Council members using the green and yellow papers. If you have a ballot paper that needs to be collected, please raise your hand and Sorrel will collect your ballot paper. You can see we've all completely entered the digital world here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sorrel, you know, maybe later. <laughs> Equally, if you've already completed your ballot papers on any other resolutions, this now seems unlikely. Uh, we'd like to, uh, to do so. We can collect those at the same time. Um, at this point of the meeting, we report back on uh, last year's resolutions. Last year, there was a resolution celebrating our volunteers 
and there's a fuller update on page 29 of the AGM booklet. I won't repeat everything that's said in the booklet, but I'd like to say both personally and on behalf of the board and, and people affected by MS that we're you know, hugely grateful for your enormous contribution. It makes such a difference. And it isn't possible for us to repay in any meaningful way that dedication shown by our volunteers. Um, but as a, as, a, as a way of reflecting it, we are working hard to, to secure the award of the Investing in Volunteers standard, which will reflect, I hope, um, how seriously we take this and, and how important we believe volunteers are to our activities. And even if we don't secure it, and I obviously hope that we will, um, I know that focusing on that is going to help us do an even better job on uh, supporting and appreciating our volunteers uh, day by day. Before carrying on, uh, I should just check that uh, whether there are any other comments regarding last year's proceedings uh, or coming from those minutes. But we'll move on now, obviously, to, to this year's. So uh, we'll now come to the first of two important resolutions at this year's AGM. The first is on the Stop MS Appeal. The resolution is that this AGM endorses the ambitious plans to raise over 100 million for the Stop MS Appeal to fund research to dramatically accelerate progress in developing treatments to slow and stop the progression of MS. You'll be able to vote for this resolution using the pink ballot paper uh, and voting will take place after the resolution has been discussed. And, um, and uh, Ruth uh, has kindly agreed to speak to this resolution. Ruth. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, everybody. We have ambitious plans to raise over £100 million through our Stop MS Appeal to fund research to dramatically accelerate progress in developing treatments to slow and stop the progression of MS. Over recent years, you will have seen considerable success in developing new treatments, but they only work for some people. There are still currently no treatments available through the NHS that, for the thousands of people who have progressive MS. So our plans include a multi-arm trial to rapidly test treatments at the same time to target progressive forms of MS. It will be a world first in neurology, and we're working with some of the best scientists and clinicians in the world to make it happen. The Stop MS Appeal began in a discrete phase in 2015, in which you've, we've been building support amongst individual donors, trusts and foundations. We have already raised more than £30 million, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the work of the MS Appeal Board, led by Sir Vernon Ellis, which has done an outstanding role in the last few years. We now plan to launch the public phase um, in 2019 with a visible and creative marketing campaign. We're really fortunate to be working with two leading marketing agencies pro bono to develop that campaign, Mediacom and Public Health UK, Publicis Health UK. Publicists are working on creative ideas for the campaign and we will be testing their ideas among people with and affected by MS across the UK in November. We aim to raise 19 million pounds of our overall target through the fundraising campaign. It's our most ambitious fundraising campaign to date. We hope to inspire the community and their friends and family to come and join us and make it a success. We plan to talk to groups and stakeholders throughout the autumn, building momentum towards May next year when we will launch the campaign. We've never had such a positive story to tell and we want the whole of the MS community to support the appeal. Together, we can stop MS. The board recommends that you vote for this resolution. Thank you, Ruth. I should add that Genevieve Edwards, who is leading our work on the public phase of the appeal, is sat just here, and, uh, and, and Emma uh, Whitcomb, who is leading our work on the appeal as a whole, uh, is sat just in the middle there. So they're both available to answer any questions you'd have if they're, um, if, uh, they're too challenging for us up at the top table. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll move to, uh, straight to any questions on those uh, on that resolution. Any questions? Hmm. Looks like everybody's very happy with that. So thank you very much. So I'll close uh, 
uh, close this resolution now. And, uh, and so just in case anybody hasn't voted, put up your hand. Okay, good. Sorry, Sorrel, still nothing to do. <laughs> yes. Uh, moving on to the second resolution at this year's AGM. The topic is growing the MS Society's community. The resolution is, this AGM supports the board in exploring the possible modernisation of our membership model. You'll be able to vote for this resolution using orange ballot papers. The voting will take place after the resolution has been discussed. And, uh, and Kerry Smith has kindly agreed to speak to this resolution. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> uh, so I personally believe that we will achieve success by working with a whole MS community to achieve our goals. And we believe we are here for the whole MS community and not just for part of it. When we were formed as a society 65 years ago, our membership model embodied our values of strength and support from the whole MS community. At the time, membership of the MS society was the most powerful way there was for the community to come together. But that has changed. There are over 100,000 people in the UK with MS and over a million who are affected by it. But our membership numbers are currently only 30,000 and they're falling. As a trustee, I am passionate that the society needs to reach out to more people than it does. The society already reaches more people than just our members for example, our newly revamped website is often the first port of call when people are diagnosed. But not all of those who engage with us remain connected. And that is a missed opportunity. People belong in very different ways now and membership is not the only way of belonging. We think that's part of the reason why the community is growing but our membership numbers are falling. We know that sometimes people who aren't members of the society can feel excluded. Some people don't want the formality of becoming a member. Some people just want to touch in and touch out as their needs change. Some people may not be able to afford the five pound membership fee. And worse still, we know that sometimes people are actually excluded by a local group because they're not formally a member. And that cannot be right. One of the three objects of the society is to support and relieve people affected by multiple sclerosis. It's not just to help and support our members. So we therefore want to start on a journey towards a new model, one that includes everyone, those who are currently members and those who aren't, one to which the whole community wants to belong today and in the future to have a model that embodies our original strength and is true to our values and to our heritage, but that is more relevant in a world which has changed in the 65 years since we were formed. Genevieve is now, I think, going to come and talk about how we intend to do that. Thank you, Kerry, and uh, good morning, everyone. As you've heard, we want to increase the number of people with MS who we currently connect to, to create a better mobilized and engaged MS community, to offer better services for people who need them, and to give people with MS a more personalized experience. In short, we want to bring the, strong, the strongest MS community in a changing world to better support people living with MS. And much has changed in the last 65 years. Perhaps the biggest change has been the way in which we connect to each other. We can and still do connect locally, but the internet has expanded our horizons so much further. We can talk to people all around the country or even the world online at the click of a button any time of day or night. And increasingly, people want to know what people like themselves experiencing what they are going through People want and can access much more personalised support and their right to demand it of us too. 
So we reach thousands of people in lots of different ways with our information and advice, uh, attending and running local groups, volunteering, campaigning, and of course, fundraising, online as well as through our membership. But we know that some people don't see us as relevant. And while our membership is strong, the current membership model where a five pound fee is charged is in decline. And there's a risk that governments and other decision makers see us as a declining force and listen to us less at a time when our voice has never been needed more. More than that, as long as our membership model is leaving some people living with MS feeling as though they're on the outside, different from us, we're not able to build the strongest MS community. So our aim is to encourage people to join for free as a friend of the MS Society. I should add that the name Friends is not set in stone, it's just a working title at this stage. But we want people to join up for free as a friend and select what they are interested in, from the type of information they need through to knowing more about local groups, how to support campaigns, or how to get involved in fundraising. A portfolio of services and support could include personalised content on issues people are specifically interested in, news feeds, news events, and online forums of interest. We'd like to offer opportunities to get involved from participating in online surveys to having a say in how the organisation is governed. And we know more and more people use the internet for everyday things. And we also know some people can't or choose not to use the internet. So we want our communication and support to be both face-to-face, -face, printed or online as people wish. Now we've conducted some initial research that supports the ideas that I've just described. And the reason we want to grow and explore a free model of membership is to reduce the barriers and appeal to those who we currently don't appeal to. We believe by having more people involved, it will give us a stronger voice, and that's key to influencing, and it will mean more people with MS can access personalized content information and support. It will also increase our supporter base and we hope open up more fundraising opportunities and in turn that will make sure that we can do more of what is needed. So we see it as offering the chance to increase the number of people who can be introduced to local groups and very importantly by involving, involving more people it will bring us closer to the whole of the MS community rather than just part of it. Now, moving to a new model definitely doesn't change the idea or feeling of belonging. There's one thing, though, that we think we'd need to change, and that's because the MS Society is a company as well as a charity, and the free model would be very difficult to combine with the current system where our members are also members under company law, so a bit like stakeholders. And that's because we'd be unlikely to have enough certainty over who the members were for company law purposes, We'd therefore anticipate that it would, for example, become the trustees who are legal members rather than it being everyone. And to move to that new model would require agreement from our current membership in order to amend our constitution. That, that needs 75% of those who choose to vote and it's why we'd need the agreement of a future AGM to make that change. We do know that there are issues where we would need to do more work before we got to that point. Since 2010, membership income has gone to local groups, and we know this is really important to many groups. So we'll find a way to protect that income, at least in the medium term. We also know that local groups need to know about people with MS living locally, and currently we're good at doing that, but only for members. Then we want more people uh, at local level to be part of our community and for local groups to know who they are. We also know we need to be accountable to the MS community and one part of that is finding the right way of choosing trustees and council members in the future. We can choose the model that's right for us and changing the identity of our members for company law purposes does not prejudge the answer to that question. And we also know that we need to make the changes in a way which overall makes us more and not less financially resilient. For example, by inviting people to become regular givers when they join so that we can replace one type of income with another. We've already spoken to our four national councils about this idea 
and carried out some initial research, which has been very supportive uh, with people with and affected by MS. If you support this resolution, we'd want though to engage over the next year or so with our current memberships, with our volunteers, the MS community, with people support, who support us now and people who don't, but hopefully will in the future, as we develop this exciting ambition and identify the right answer to the questions I've just talked about. Once we have it, then it would be for a future AGM to agree to the legal changes needed to make this idea a reality. I hope that's a helpful explanation and we very much hope that you'll support this resolution. Thank you, Jen. And uh, we'll move straight to questions on that resolution. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please wait for a mic. Yes, I see one at the back there. Thank you. If you could just wait for a microphone, that'd be great. If you could introduce yourself and... Uh, and we'd love My to name is Anne Wordingham. I voted against this resolution because I didn't know what I was voting for. If I had had the opportunity to listen to the proposer today, I might have done something different. And I think that caused a lot of um, concern locally that they didn't understand what it was about. And I think that's a great pity. Okay, well, thank you very much for that comment. And I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that now you've heard the explanation, it's, it's clear and we'll certainly think about how we can communicate as clearly in our written sort of uh, uh, discussion of this as we have this morning. I think that's a really interesting point for us, but I am pleased that you're, you, you feel better about it now. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Um, therefore, I'm going to close this resolution, and I'll assume there aren't any uh, rogue uh, betting, uh, betting slips, uh, voting slips out there. <laughs> anyway, you can put some betting slips in as well. Give us all something to do. Um, so we'll take uh, resolution three and four together, as they're both linked to financial matters. They're on the same blue ballot paper. Um, uh, resolution three is this AGM receives the annual report and accounts of the MS Society 2017 following the audit by MS Society's auditors Hayes McIntyre. Resolution four is that this AGM appoints Hayes McIntyre as the MS Society auditors for the 2018 annual report and accounts. And uh, Stuart uh, has kindly agreed to speak to these resolutions. Stuart. Thank you, Nick, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, in terms of these two resolutions, receiving the annual report and accounts and appointing auditors, it's a formal part of every AGM. The annual report and accounts for 2017 have been signed by the auditors, who we would also intend to reappoint as our auditors for 2018. Uh, and the Board of Trustees recommends that you vote, uh, if you haven't already, uh, which you probably have, uh, for both of these resolutions. Um, I've asked Vicky, our Executive Director of Finance, Strategy and Impact, to provide a brief financial review of last year and a summary of results. Vicky. Thanks, Stuart. Stuart says, I'm going to give a brief summary of the annual accounts for the year ended December 2017. The full financial statements for, are available in the annual report and accounts uh, which were on the MS Society's website. I should start by saying that the accounts have been prepared under SORP 2015, the accounting regulation applicable to charities. I'm really pleased to report that all bar one of our local groups use the accounting online system to submit their year-end figures, making the production of the, of the annual report and accounts so much easier and quicker. So thanks, for all, thanks to all the, the finance volunteers that have transitioned over, the, over to this new system over the last couple of years. It's really helped. Turning to the financial position itself, in 2017, we've maintained the exceptionally high income levels generated in 2016, raising £28.9 million. 
Having seen a period of 12.5% growth between 2013 and 2016, I reported at the AGM last year that we did not anticipate this growth continuing in 2017 for two main reasons. Firstly, having diversified our income in 2014 into major donors, trust and statutory donors, we, had, we did see rapid initial growth up to a level of 4 million in 2016. We've now seen this plateauing in, at the 4 million level in 2017. Also, we face an external economic environment that is difficult and has had an impact on our income with individual fundraising and community events both ending the year slightly below the 2016 level. We hope that through the extraordinary generosity of our supporters and the MS community, we will be able to maintain the 2017 levels of income in 2018. Looking at the types of income in a little more detail, our legacy programme continues to be an important source of, of income for the MS Society. And for the second consecutive year, we have received one particularly large legacy, meaning that the total legacies are 300,000 higher than 2016. Leaving a gift to the MS Society is a particularly generous and thoughtful thing to do. And we are grateful to everyone who remembered us in their will. 11.5 million pounds is an incredible tribute. In 2017, we saw individuals, groups and organisations undertake a vast range of different activities to raise funds for our work. This resulted in donations and trading, whilst being 4% down below the 2016 levels, generating a vital 16 million pounds. Over the last three year, few years, Michelle has talked, talked about the need to diversify our income and in 2017, two new areas are particularly noteworthy. We held our first million pound fundraising event in the form of a tribute concert, concert to the late Jacqueline Dupre. The income is split over two years um, and so isn't showing entirely in these, these accounts and sits within trading activities. This is a significant contribution towards the 100 million Stop MS Appeal target. We were, also delighted to, we were also delighted to receive a grant from the Big Lottery Fund and for the, M, for the MS, sorry, for the My MS, My Rights, My Needs projects in Wales. This represents a positive step towards our ambition to increase our income from institutional funders. Turning to expenditure, in total, in total we spent 28.8 million in 2017 as opposed to 29.5 million in 2016. This reflects the commitment that was made again by Michelle to deliver our unrestricted activities within the balanced budget. The goals prioritise the areas that people with MS have told us, told us we should focus on. And as a result of this, we, we have seen a 15% increase to 4.4 million in the amount we spent on goal one, effective treatments. The increase here represents us co-funding a major new clinical trial in symphostatin. In total, across all the goals, we spent 5.2 million on research grants, which are broken down in detail in the annual report and accounts, and 1.4 million on individual support grants. Expenditure on our responsive care and support programme, our second goal, reduced slightly in 2017, as a, but that's as a comparative figure to 2016, which included the investment in MS Life. In 2016, we invested, we invested in fundraising so that we could, we could fund our ambitious strategy, not only during the year, but also in future years. We have maintained this level of investment in 2017. Turning to the balance sheet, and these, these slides show a summary of the key aspects of the, ba of the balance sheet between 2014 and 2017, if you can read them. Um, fixed, assets, fixed assets have gone down slightly, 
as some of our as some of our volunteer groups have decided to dispose of their properties and there have been no significant additions in 2017. Investments have gone from 14.3 million to 16.3 million and this is a combination of realised and unrealised investment gains. Current assets are up by three uh, are made up of 3.9 million of cash and short-term investments and 3.7 million of debtors, which is 800,000 more than, la than, the, than the debtors in 2016 because of accrued legacy income. Creditors have remained virtually consistent year on year and include a 7.5 million pound research grant creditor. At the end of 2017, the society had 19.2 in million in total funds. The board reviews the reserve policy every year. In 2016, the board changed the reserve policy to take, account, take into account our, ambitious, our ambition to make a significant investment into the clinical trials in the future and fundraise for those investments during the lifetime of the project. This has resulted in us holding negative restricted reserves of 247,000 at the end of 2017. The board also has a designated fund for research, which stood at 5.9 million at the end of 2017. Of the 19.2 million unrestricted funds, 5.5 million relates to the carrying value of fixed assets, the general fund of 7.8 million sits comfortably within the revised reserve policy and we believe is sufficient to enable us to continue, to continue our services and activities if a significant risk crystallised resulting in unplanned expenditure or a drop in income. And finally, Hayes McIntyre were the MS Society's external auditors in 2017 and provided a robust audit service and good support. It is recommended that we retain the auditors for, the fur for a further year and appoint Hayes McIntyre to carry out the audit on the 2018 annual report and accounts. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, as well. Um, any questions on those two resolutions or what you've heard? No? Denise. What does a negative restricted reserve mean? So basically we haven't yet generated raised the funds for that for that reserve. So we're spending on some of the projects and some of the research projects, knowing that over the lifetime of the research project we will get the income. And so effectively until we've got that income it sits as a negative restrictive reserve. But that's why the designated reserve is important because that sort of balances out the risks on that. Good, anything else? Okay, so we'll close uh, on those resolutions. We'll assume there are no slips to collect on those. Um, so uh, now we'll move on to the review of 2017 with Michelle. I have to lower this a little bit. Um, there are many great advantages uh, and privileges to being the chief executive at the MS Society. Uh, one of which is I, unlike the other speakers, can control the slide. So I have been given the power to control my own slide, which I'm delighted about. So let's get going. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say was, uh, of course, the MS Society was founded in 1956. And since that time, we have grown from one friendly society to hundreds of groups across the country with five and a half thousand volunteers providing support, services and friendship to over 13,000 people. In today's money, we've invested in over £218 million in research. And throughout our history, we have fought tooth and nail 
to ensure that people with, ham with MS have access to effective treatments which are free at the point of need and also that we have the provision of specialist nurses who are so highly valued by people with MS and that we have decent community care in each and every one of our nations so that people are supported to live their very best lives possible. And most importantly, since we were started all those years ago, together as a community, we have transformed people's lives. In 1956, there was very little understanding about the biology of MS. There was very little understanding of what it meant to live with MS. And you've put us forward today, 2018, our understanding is completely different. When we look at the opportunities we have, when we look at the treatments that are available, when we look at the services and support that are available, massive progress has been made. But I don't know about you, I think human beings don't really see incremental progress. When people say, what are the great events in history? Uh, what do you remember? You remember a crisis. You remember an emergency. But when you look at our 65 year plus history, you will see the MS Society has made progress every single year. And that incremental progress at times, sometimes huge leaps of progress, have meant that people have a great opportunity to live with MS today. But of course, there is a huge amount to be done. So before we talk about some of our achievements, I wanted to just pay tribute and thanks to the work of our volunteers, our dedicated staff, people with MS, supporters and donors, and all of those people who care about MS, for your outstanding contribution, dedication and commitment, not just in 2017, but for many it was 2007 and 1997, so it's not just a year of commitment, for some it's decades of commitment. And I would like to thank you for, at times, the wacky sense of humour that you have in supporting our activities. And I'm sure that will be in full show tomorrow at the MS Walk, where we will be turning uh, Battersea Park orange again. So I'd like to reflect just briefly on 2017 and I'll touch upon some big highlights and then go into a little bit of detail later. So if a new treatment for MS, cladribine, available on the NHS. Great steps forward with a new licensed treatment uh, called ocrelizumab, available uh, uh, in the UK for people with relapsing and remitting MS. So what we see again there is that people with primary progressive MS have not been given access to that treatment, and I would add yet. And that's why today we're seeing the MS community mobilised right across our four nations. Over 18,500 people have signed in a couple of weeks our petition to make sure when we have progress in science and our understanding of treatments, that results in treatments for people with MS free at the point of need. I think we've also seen the MS Society be bold and stand up and out, initially sometimes on our own, to make a powerful case for change, whether that's in relation to the changes in the welfare benefits system, or that's to ensure that cannabis is available for people with MS with pain and spasticity. We've been bold in our, our calls, and I think the community has responded to that boldness by supporting in ever greater numbers our campaigning activity. We talked about our volunteers, uh, gave 700,000 hours of time to support uh, people living with and affected by MS, 700,000 hours. We are so privileged because of the support that people give to our community. And as Vicky said, we also raised over 29 million pounds to support our vital activity. And we could not do that without the generous support, time and commitment of many, many, many people. And I would just want to thank again that support for that support. 
And finally, we have seen in 2017 uh, excellent innovation within research, and we're delighted to be co-funding a uh, breakthrough clinical trial called STAT2, which is looking at a repurposed drug for progressive MS. So some really, really important highlights for us. But we live, I suppose, in an uncertain world, and it can feel pretty uncertain at the moment. Uh, Donald Trump, as president of the US, brings a little bit of uncertainty. Brexit, a little bit more. Um, but we also see the rapid changes in data technology, artificial intelligence. All of this brings challenges, but opportunities. We see the public sector under a terrible squeeze still and the effects of a recession, although we're coming out of a recession, the effects on public expenditure have hit the MS community incredibly hard, both at a national level where we've seen health funding uh, uh, decline in real terms because of a growing population and especially at a community level, particularly in England, where we've seen the stripping out of community support and social care, the essentials with everyday living being stripped away in our local communities. And I think when we think about some of the big effects, the big impacts on people with MS, many of them were started over five years ago because public policy changes have had a huge effect on the MS community. We have seen the NHS dominated by uh, debates about funding, and we have seen the welfare benefits have a disastrous effect on many people's lives. In fact, I would go further and say we have seen a systematic assault on disabled and uh, people with long-term chronic conditions over the last five years. And this is a story that has not yet been told. We have been at the forefront of telling the story of the systematic uh, uh, reduction of money, of services and support, which is leaving many of the most vulnerable people in our community, in the MS community, worried, stressed, and certainly not able to live the best lives that they wish to lead. It is real hardship that we see. And I mentioned social care, the stripping away of the support for uh, essential everyday living. We fought hard and spoke loud on that issue, probably for the first time in a long time, in response to what the MS community have told us. But we also see incredible opportunities, huge opportunities, when we look at the MS world. Diagnosis has improved significantly. There's a global consensus on access to early treatments. There's a strong pipeline of research which gives us promise about neuroprotection and remyelination and our ability to slow, stop and in time reverse the accumulation of disability. We have seen the signs of some good models of care, some transformation in the services that are provided with and to people within the NHS, and particularly draw upon the work in Walton and in Manchester. And that shows signs of what's possible in the future. We have new knowledge and insight in research, which again brings us hope. And I think importantly, what we have seen, which is a great opportunity for us, is the MS community coming together yet again to provide the strongest voice on the issues that matter, whether that's in relation to access to treatments, welfare benefits, social care. Time and time again at a national level, we have seen the community come together and increasingly on a local level on issues that matter. And we've also seen a huge appetite for international collaboration. And we're very proud of our part, our role in the progressive uh, international, uh, uh, progressive MS International Alliance, where we want to bring the brightest and the best in the world together to make urgent progress 
on progressive MS. So all of these things, the challenges, the opportunities, the pressure, the progress that we feel, are all real. But it's our job to ensure that we continue, as our leadership changes, to make even more progress in future years. But before talking about some specifics, I would like to pay tribute, particularly to Patricia Gordon, who will be stepping down shortly in her role as Northern Ireland Director. Patricia has given the MS community outstanding service and leadership for over a decade now. And we wish Patricia every, every success in, in whatever role she takes forward in the future. We would like to thank Paul Armadi for his great contribution as our Director of Engagement and Fundraising and wish him well at the British Red Cross where he has entered and taken that cause on with passion. And we would like to welcome David Galloway, who will be our new Northern Ireland director, uh, who started last Monday. So uh, delighted that as our leadership changes, we will bring in new people and have a new perspective on how together we will make uh, important contributions. So our number one goal is access to effective treatments. We still hold that goal of getting to 70% of people uh, who have access to effective treatments by 2019, and we're making really good progress. Over 5,000 people in Northern Ireland spoke up and out when the Belfast Trust consulted on uh, uh, reducing the expensive MS treatments, and the MS community across the UK made our voice loud and clear, and that proposal was dropped. We've also, uh, as I said, had a huge role in contributing to the change in public attitudes and government policy on access to cannabis for medicinal purposes, for, for pain and spasticity for people with MS. All of these issues, as well as a strong investment in our research, means that we are confident that we're making the right steps towards achieving our goals. Responsive care and support is critical. Uh, you heard Vicky talk about the big lottery funding in Wales for uh, My MS, My Choices programme. That is for a group of people who need face-to-face -face support, who want face-to-face -face support to enable them to navigate what can be a complex care system to ensure they get the benefits, the treatments and the support that they need to live their best lives. I think this is a fantastic piece of work and uh, combined with very strong evaluation will not only show us what we want to do in the future, but I think it will show many, many other uh, health organisations a new model of working with people who have long-term conditions. We also have a very highly valued helpline, and I'm pleased to say that over 18,000 callers came to our helpline offering crucial emotional support at a time of need, a time when people need to share, and a time when people need information. This is a growing service that takes uh, a, a hugely significant role in the support that we provide. Preventing MS. We, of course, want to see a world where we're not just treating MS, but we're preventing MS. And we've taken forward many of the findings of a major conference that we had, a research conference, to look at what are the key risk factors and how can we modify those risk factors. Um, one of the issues that came out of that uh, was the importance of the global MS movement focusing on smoking cessation. What we have done is planned and prepared a campaign, first of the, our type, we've ever done it, to coincide with Stoptober. And I'm really pleased that the MS Society will be providing information and support on this critical issue of smoking cessation, because of course it can have such a negative impact on people's MS. Quality information, it's the main reason most people initially come to us. At a time of diagnosis or a time of transition, people want expert information high quality accredited information and again this year our information has been award-winning 
on a number of fronts. We continue to be accredited at the highest levels for the quality information, and we've tested, tried, and changed the way we communicate that information to make sure we're resonating with people in a way in which they want to receive communication. Our website, uh, uh, we had over 2.8 million hits on our website last year, so that remains often the front door to people coming to us, and hopefully people will see the improvement in the information content with that. We talked about when we were born, 1956, this sense of a strong community supporting to people, supporting people to live independent lives runs through our DNA. And yet again, we've had another fantastic, uh, fantastic year. The support our local groups provide is incredible. Many of those five and a half thousand volunteers providing 13,000 people with services, support, friendship and a listening ear have MS themselves. Their commitment is outstanding and delighted that we have both modernised our local network and we've also retained many of our volunteers and attracted new volunteers to the MS Society. We've campaigned on welfare, we've campaigned on uh, disability benefit cuts and we've campaigned on social care. So a strong voice on the issues that matter most. We also recognise the importance of carers. Carers are critical in the lives of people with MS and they are critical to us at the MS Society. So we're delighted to continue to support uh, carers through our national uh, programme of grants uh, to improve well-being and support them to have some respite and care, but also proud to be part of a much broader coalition of organisations who are working to ensure that there is a change of policy at a national level and that, that our information and support that we provide is up to date and we have refreshed the support we've provided for our carers. And of course, one of the strong themes of our goals is greater certainty. The uncertainty for, of MS, the uncertainty of the diagnosis, the uncertainty of how people's condition will progress is a huge issue. So we are working continuously with the scientific community and investing in uh, understanding this issue better through our grants programme uh, in particular. So across our seven goals, we've made quite a lot of progress. And as we look towards 2018, we will continue to build on this good work. And I would just want to highlight a short number of uh, areas for you to look out, for you to question us on next year to see if we have made the progress we set out to do. The first is building on uh, personalised uh, lifelong support to people with MS and developing new services, including digital services continuing to prove, improve access to treatment and fighting to ensure that people with MS not only have new treatments, particularly for progressive MS, but those that are licensed are available on the NHS. We will look at how we better influence the NHS through, through uh, modernising and changing our care and services research uh, this year. And also, as you've heard, get ready for the Stop MS Appeal and uh, uh, improving our membership offer. So 2018 has been a busy year where we've taken forward these areas uh, together. But I would just want to conclude uh, with some reflections in my final uh, few minutes. So it's my last year. Uh, as the, at the age you're in, oh, no, you can still oh I can, I can, I can still come. It's my last year uh, here in control of the come clicker at the AGM. I, I shall certainly be along as a member. Uh, it's been a real privilege for me, and I would want to say thanks to you all uh, for the support and counsel that you have given to me uh, as people with MS as volunteers, as supporters, as trustees. Um, I've, I've valued it hugely, and I have tried to make the best contribution I could. 
That wasn't timed, and that might prevent me from crying, which is good. But we, we, we have, as we look towards the future, some big challenges. And uh, I am so confident that our leadership team, our, S, our, our RMS community, will really respond and meet these challenges. Access to effective treatment is huge and remains important. It's not good enough to have the science and to have the research. We have to have the treatments available for people to slow and stop the progression of MS. And that will be a long and windy road and one which I am sure we will, we will walk together. There remains significant variation in access to services and treatment, unacceptably so. Depending on where you live, really, really alters and affects the services and the quality of services that you get. We must not let the advances that we're making in data digital tech mean that our MS community becomes less equal. We cannot allow inequalities to persist in the way they are at the moment, and we certainly cannot allow them to grow. We must continue to speak out and speak truth to power because for many, many people with MS, despite all of the opportunities, despite all of the progress that we have seen made, if you are in need of critical care, if you are in need of help getting out of your bed in the morning and fed and showered, if you are in need of money to get a taxi to go to your doctors, for an appointment or to see your neurologist, you have found life has got significantly worse because of the way in which a number of national policies have changed. And we must never, despite the opportunities we have before us, we must never lose sight of the very, very real difficulties people are experiencing today. I also think uh, over the last five years, there has been a worrying and disturbing hardening of attitudes to people with disabilities and long-term conditions. Some of the language that's used, the hostility that people feel and the discrimination that people feel is very worrying and we have to stand up and out against that. And we must continue to retain and grow the reputation and trust that we have. It has been built up over 65 years and we can see as we do around us how that can be taken away. So we have to have the highest levels of integrity uh, uh, and trust and respect that trust. So I think when we look at the three pillars of who the MS Society is and has been for over 65 years, help remains a core part of who we are. Helping each other the MS Society uh, working with and alongside people with MS. The MS community has always known you cannot rely on the state to solve your problems. That's why the MS community comes together to help each other. But we have to be mindful of the pressure that that can bring, especially on our volunteers. That in terms of hope and our research programme, we have the most unprecedented opportunities um, as our understanding and our knowledge grows. And I believe strongly with that, uh, breakthroughs in science, breakthroughs in understanding, that we will see a time with a mass movement of people with MS supporting the Stop MS Appeal, a time when we do slow, stop and reverse the accumulation of disability. And community and voice, which is the third pillar of the MS Society, remains as strong as it ever has been and will grow because politics really does matter. When we look at the biggest changes that have happened, they are as also a result of changes in public policy. So investing and sustaining that voice, building that community, making sure that people with MS are at the absolute front of that and center of it is critical. So we've always been a bold charity. We will continue to be a bold charity we absolutely need to be rooted in the needs, aspirations of people with MS, and we must respond to what people with MS tell us. And I think that's possible, it's entirely doable, and if we follow some basic principles, we will grow and flourish. 
work alongside people with MS and focus on the issues that matter most. Engage policymakers in the public in the pursuit of our goals. Develop world-class research and infrastructure. Support excellent fundraising, which matches our ambitions. Attract the very best staff and volunteers who we value and support. Collaborate and partner with those who will enable us to go quicker and achieve our impact. Be trusted and trustworthy and believe together that we will stop MS. I can't predict the future, but I do predict that together we will stop MS. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, inspiring, passionate, committed mm -hmm. to the last. Thank, thank you. you. Um, there'll be more said later on, uh, on, on Michelle's departure, but I just want to say personally now, having heard you talk about our work, that you've been a terrific CEO. I miss you. And uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. Um, so Do I get a carriage clock? <laughs> no. The carriage clock. We're still working on okay. the carriage clock. <laughs> I'm obsessed with the carriage clock. So. Right. So to, 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 Thank to move you. on to the resolutions. Great. Thank yeah. you. We'll now move to the results of the resolutions of the elections and trustee councils. And I've had the thumbs up. Uh, so uh, I'm going to declare each of the results separately. All the figures will be on the screen behind me. Shortly. <laughs> Thank you. So resolution one, uh, stop MS appeal for... 3,577 against 294. Uh, this resolution is carried. Very good. Resolution two, growing the MS community. Uh, for 3,776 against 106. So this resolution is carried. The annual reports and accounts 2017 for 3,787 against 30. So this resolution is carried. Uh, resolution four, appointment of the auditors, uh, 3,797 against 31. So this resolution is carried. In the election to the Board of Trustees, the following three individuals have been elected, with the votes for those individuals being shown on the side. Susan Crane, and Shinquin, Rufus Ollins. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. During the election, three candidates um, withdrew we would normally have offered the choice to vote for or against candidates where the number of candidates corresponds with or is less than the number of vacancies. But the withdrawal of these candidates happened too late for this to be possible. Voting numbers for the remaining Cymru candidates and therefore being declared based simply on the number of votes cast for those individuals. The board has ratified this revised approach. That's Mark Carey, Catherine Foote, Glyn Jones, Jeanette Barton, and Howard Bishop. So congratulations to them. In terms of the Northern Ireland election, oh, in terms of no, England. England or Northern England. Ireland? England. England. Um, okay. In terms of England, uh, we have Philip Gamble, Eve Darwood, Peter Hicks, Don Thorpe, and David Allen. For Northern Ireland, we have Ivan Prue, Philippa Watson, Theresa Levy, Andrew Taylor, Ian Pulteney, Peter McReynolds, and Catherine Doran. Okay. I think that's me. Ah, Scotland. Scotland. Sorry, excuse yeah. me, Scotland. Uh, for the Scotland Council elections, Dorothy Robertson, Jennifer Bryson, 
Laura Beveridge and Linda Mason. So thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so as some of you will know, this is the point where we do two things, one formal and one more informal normally. Um, formally, we need to accept the retirement of any trustee who's retiring at the end of this year. This means that this year we'll be accepting the retirement at the end of December of Esther Foreman and John Grosvenor. More informally, it's uh, normally an occasion where we publicly thank and give shining stars to departing trustees. Unfortunately, John and Esther couldn't be here today uh, and have given their apologies for today's meeting. We do, however, though, uh, you know, I certainly do want to thank them uh, for all they've contributed and, uh, and assure you all who will be very worried about this that they'll be receiving their shining stars uh, on another occasion, another way. Um, I do have a few thank yous. One is to all of you for coming along today and, uh, and attending this year's AGM because it's important to us to hear your views in many many ways and uh, and this is uh, one of them and also thanks to the electoral reform services for conducting our ballot. Um, to conclude I'm now going to ask Hugh who's been chair of Cymru National Council since 2016 to propose a vote of thanks. Hugh, welcome. Well, you can tell from my accent I'm from Wales, so I'm going to start in my own language. I'm going to talk about the way to talk to Nick, and I'm going to talk to you about the way to talk to you about the way to talk to you about the way to talk to you thank you, Nick, and express my thanks to you for allowing me the opportunity to close today's meeting with a vote of thanks. It's a pleasure to serve under your leadership. I'm not as short as Michelle. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve under your leadership of the Board of Trustees and that leadership has great understanding for those both with and affected by MS. It's this empathy that has ensured the MS society moves forward, addresses the needs of the individual while simultaneously strives to find new treatments that one day we are sure will stop MS. I can't go from here without saying a special thank you today to our Chief Executive, Michelle. I know everybody else will, so I better throw my bit in. Today is your last AGM, we know that, and I can't speak highly enough for you, for your inspirational leadership you have shown within the society. I've got my stuff written here, but I'm going to add what you just said for 2019 and afterwards was absolutely inspirational. Thank you very, very much. Together with your team, you've led the MS Society through an exciting period of positive developmental change. You've positioned the society where it's able to move forward with firm foundations for future success, and we all wish you success in your new role. You face an exciting challenge ahead of you, and I suppose we do as well. I was going to say I ask you just one thing, but you've actually committed to that now, that we'll see you here sitting down here with us next year. Um, you. If you aren't sitting down here next year, I will give you an orange wig <laughs> and invite you to run a certain marathon, but we won't go there. Okay. We do know that um, in the future, a new chief executive will take your place. And what he or she will find is a strong, supportive team from the executive group through the staff across the UK, including our offices in Northern Ireland, Scotland, and of course in Hamry in Wales. I take this opportunity to give my thanks to that team for their professionalism and continued commitment to the society and those affected by MS. And of course we'd be nowhere without our members and our friends. You're an inspiration to us all. I trust they're all watching on video or whatever they're watching on because the tireless work that they undertake in the groups fundraising, supporting those with MS, that is to me the driving force of this society. From the centre of the big cities to the countryfied areas, they ensure that our reach meets all and makes a positive difference to their lives. Today, yes, we've just elected new trustees and council members. I applaud the time and commitment they give to support the work of the MS Society. They work within the local and wider communities, ensuring that the voice of those who is heard and issues addressed. 
And at the end of this year, we've had a number of trustees and council members who are coming to the end of their term. And I offer our thanks to each and every one of those, for the, and for they have contributed to the strategic direction and ongoing work of this society, and being prepared to give that most precious commodity that each and every one of us have, and that's our time. To those elected and re-elected today, welcome. You'll find the position you've been elected to challenging and highly rewarding. It'll be good to meet you and to share and to learn from each other. Today we have undertaken the statutory duties that the society has to follow, but we mustn't forget that we are here today for all of those affected by MS. What we've achieved to date is outstanding. The challenge is being met and together we can and together we will move forward, make a difference to the lives of others with one united aim, to stop MS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugh. Beautifully done. And uh, that concludes the formal business of the AGM, which required legally and under our constitution. And I formally declare the Multiple Sclerosis Society's 8th Annual General Meeting closed. I would, though, like to proceed with an open forum. And uh, members of the Board of Trustees and Senior Management are here to answer your questions. And we are actually bang on time, so we've got a few minutes uh, to take um, questions in open forum and uh, certainly thereafter over lunch just outside. So, um, so either of those options are open to you. Um, are there any questions? Yes, from our new trustee. Thank you very much. Thank you for Welcome. all those who voted for me. Um, so I'm very pleased to be on the trustees. I don't have a question. I have an announcement, so mm -hmm. I hope this is okay. Um, I've also been part of a group of people trying to set up a local group in um, an area of London, which has never, which has not had a group for a while, uh, Westminster, Hammersmith, and Kensington and Chelsea. Um, so we're setting up a local group, and we're having a launch event next Sunday. If you know anybody who lives in, is affected by, lives with, cares for anybody with MS, in those three districts, I will give you a flyer, and they're welcome to come along to our, our launch event. And we're hoping to get more people coming along and doing fundraising and supporting and information giving and all of those things. We've got various social things planned. So, and, and again, thanks again for people voting for me and, uh, and just wanted to let you know about this group. Thank you. Thank you, that's really great. Anything else? Yes, John, and then one at, uh, at the back. Thanks very much. Yeah, John Litchfield. I wonder if I could just ask for comments, um, hopefully from Michelle and obviously the others as well. One of the things that concerns me about the charity sector in general is that um, if you tend to watch morning TV, uh, like I do now, I'm retired, <laughs> almost every day, or certainly every week, it seems new charities are being launched and they're often um, representing areas that have already got very strong charities in. And my concern is that, in, one, that duplicates effort in the sense of there's a cost to being a charity, as we all know, as just being there. There's also the costs of salaries, all the things that take to run a charity. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on that, because certainly in the sector you're going to, there are loads of little charities, people set them up. And I think that is a problem going forward because I think it dilutes the message quite often. And it also means more money is being spent on just running them. And at the second part of the question, is there any progress we're making within the MS sector? Where I think, I, I, I don't think we've got quite as many as there is in the cancer sector, but there's certainly probably half a dozen MS charities. Um, and we have sort of haven't really progressed, have we, in bringing them together? Could you comment on that? Thanks. Yes, thank you. So I think you raise a really important point, John, about a proliferation of smaller charities that are often set up because people are very passionate and have a personal connection to the cause, as was the case over 65 years ago for the MS Society. But I do think uh, the Charity Commission, many commentators have, have been very clear there is a great opportunity for organisations to merge in similar sectors um, and also to collaborate much more effectively. I mean, one of the things uh, I think it's true you haven't seen mergers in the MS sector, but what you have seen is much uh, greater collaboration within the MS sector, particularly over the last three or so years. 
a strong focus for that has been around the policy and campaigning work. We've also explored how we can better uh, uh, develop our information content and materials and measure and evaluate the impact that we're having. And uh, we are always open-minded about working with anybody who will help us get there sooner, make progress sooner. And we have found the collaboration on an international scale and within research incredibly powerful. Uh, if anything, I would say in the MS field, we've seen speedier and greater collaboration within research and the global MS movement uh, unforeseen when you look at it five years ago, but we do have some way and some progress to make domestically. Um, I saw one at the back here, I saw and then over here. I just wanted to ask if you um, considered having the AGM in different parts of the UK, because um, in order to get here for 11 o'clock in the morning is really difficult anyway. And I, I, I don't think that's a good time to start. But um, I think if you want to encourage people to come, then we need to embrace the whole of the UK. And sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and uh, we have thought a bit about that. It's not always been here in my time. Of course, we were down at the XL, but that's London as well. Um, so, um, yeah, um, have we, um, there's a question of cost, I guess. But uh, have we, can you remember, it, Michelle, have we thought about this? Uh, I, I think we have had it in different parts of the country. I think when we've combined it with potentially MS Life before I joined. Um, um, but your point is well made and it's one that we will consider because we absolutely want to be inclusive and uh, reach out to all of the MS community and certainly consider that for future, future years. Yep, good one. Thank you. I'm Gary Kasulu. I was the chair of Barnet for a little while. Michelle, a question for you. If you had a magic wand and you yeah. could do one thing... Other than the clicker, you one mean. One thing, what would that be? And my second question would be, uh, what is your one niggle, the one thing that you would have loved to achieve and you didn't, didn't quite get there? And if I can squeeze it in, what's your biggest achievement while you've been here? Is that three? Three questions. <laughs> three big questions. Gosh. Say them again, because you said you were going to have one. <laughs> we're going reverse order. We're going reverse order. What's, what's been your biggest achievement while you've been the CEO? Um, well, I, I, I don't see it as being my achievement, first and f foremost, absolutely. I, I think our ability to... Uh, I will respond in it. I think we have three achievements, uh, like your three questions. Uh, one is the ability to work with the best and the brightest around the world to make progress uh, for all of the MS community to find access to effective treatments and then to build a mass movement of change for a hundred million pound fundraising campaign. Uh, and I think we're well on our way to doing that. I think the combination of hope and a strong fundraising uh, campaign to achieve our central goal of access to effective treatments has been very important. And there have been many, many, many people who have, have uh, contributed to that. I think on help, um, I think that the um, uh, modernization and transformation of our local networks has seen really significant and steady improvement in our reach, the quality of services uh, that, that we provide with our volunteers and an expansion particularly of the helpline has, has been important. And then thirdly, uh, I think voice and community. So when you look at the contribution the MS community has made on some of the biggest issues of our day, welfare, social care, access to cannabis for medicinal purposes, we have been bold and unafraid and have led the sector. So I think those three pillars rather than one are critical. Really proud of, so your magic wand. Uh, well, I would want uh, to stop MS. <laughs> I wish we'd done it on day one of my joining the MS Society. I wish people had, uh, we had cured MS. And if we couldn't cure it with a magic wand, we'd want to slow, stop and reverse the accumulation of disability. And I would desperately want that to happen 
as soon as possible. And that's what I'd do with that magic wand. And then the third? The niggle. The uh, niggle. What was the one thing that you've left and you think, well, I hope the next person manages to achieve that? Well, I think there are always things you wish you could have done better. I think we have a uh, great opportunity to, to, to build domestic collaborations uh, and to strengthen the MS community, but that we have to push ahead with our modernisation. We have to understand that the MS community is diverse, it's heterogeneous, and that we must ensure we provide lifelong personalised support in a time and a place and a choosing for the MS community, and that to be rooted in a really clear understanding of the needs and aspirations of the MS community. And I wish that could have been, could have been faster on that one. Thank you very much, yeah. and um, good luck with your new job. Thank you, thank you very much. Good, anything else? Okay, well, thank you again, everybody, for coming along today. And uh, I'll bring this uh, open forum to a close, but emphasize that we're um, uh, the, the, the trustees, national council chairs, and, uh, and uh, substantially the executive group are around over lunch. So uh, please feel free to uh, get us by the throat and ask any question you'd like to. Uh, thank you. Lunch is next door. Thank you very much. Oh.